It all started back when I was about 16 years old, and my friends and I decided we would take a long camping trip in the Shawnee National Forest, located in southern Illinois. At the time, we considered ourselves outdoorsmen. We all loved to camp, hike, and fish. We couldn't wait to explore the wilderness, away from all of our small-town lives. So, on the day in question, we quickly loaded up our gear and set off on a beautiful spring day in May. We were excited to experience nature at its finest, and the first few days even went by without incident. We had hiked through the woods, swam in a small stream, and were just generally enjoying each other's company. Now, as the days went by, we each started to notice some odd things happening. In fact, the first was an incident that we could easily brush off as a coincidence, or maybe it was just our paranoia. On one of the mornings, we found our food, or at least one of the bags of food, scattered all around the campsite. Even though we had it secured in a bear bag, we figured it might have been raccoons or maybe another curious critter that had managed to get into our supplies. The most we could do was just try and write it off the best we could. But things would gradually get stranger. We would hear strange noises in the middle of the night. Things like laughter or voices talking in a language we could not decipher. The other thing was that it would come from all directions and it wasn't just one of us hearing it. All of us talked about hearing the exact same noises. It was unsettling, but we tried to convince ourselves it was just the wind playing tricks on us. Now, on one of the evenings, we were sitting around the fire, cooking our dinner, when we all heard a loud crashing sound nearby. It sounded as if someone had just felled a tree. I mean, it was very loud. And in fact, it even shook the ground. We all felt it, but we saw no motion in the trees or anything to indicate that a tree had fallen over. I mean, what else is going to do that in the middle of the woods? At this point in the night, it was, well, it was more like the evening time. Not exactly night yet, but dark enough that you needed a flashlight. So, we decided to investigate, because why not? If it had been a fallen tree... Maybe it was safer to move our campsite in a larger clearing. But when we had reached the spot where we had sworn the noise had come from, there was nothing there. No fallen trees, no disturbed brush, just a very eerie silence. In fact, one of our friends noticed how there was not even the sounds of crickets, when at this time, there should be. And we were all left with a lingering sense of unease. We could feel it. It was like a prickle going down your neck. When we had made it back to camp, none of us were really sure how to explain it. And in fact, we were pretty much quiet for a little while after, unsettled by what had just happened. I think we had tried to write it off as the wind playing tricks on us, and that maybe we had all just imagined the sound, and maybe imagined the shaking of the ground. Perhaps a group hallucination, But very quickly, we brushed that off because, I mean, really, how possible is that? But we resumed the night and tried to have a good time still. A couple hours later, one of our friends swore he saw a pair of eyes watching us from the tree line farthest away from the campfire. He said it was two yellow eyes, but we hardcore made fun of him and joked that he was extremely paranoid and was now seeing the boogeyman in the woods. Shortly after that, we all decided to go to bed. We were tired, and we just wanted to get the day over with. Now, the friend that swore he saw the eyes decided to stay up and sit by the fire. Whatever, fine by me. We told him it was his job to put it out, and to make sure there were no embers left before he returned to bed. One of our other friends decided to stay up there with him and talk to him, because even though he was advocating for staying up later, he was acting weird, just out of character. It's hard to explain. At some point in the night, 
I don't remember exactly when I drifted off to sleep, but we were still ripping on my friend hardcore in the tent, and I passed out. I woke up to the sounds of someone outside screaming bloody murder. As you could expect, I pretty much jumped out of my sleeping bag, running nearly butt naked out of my tent to investigate the source of the screaming. I was met with my other friends who were curious as well, and we looked around. The fire was still going, but just barely. In my half-asleep stupor, I could make out that the screaming was farther off in the woods. Things felt very serious and dangerous at this point. I quickly turned to my other friends and said, we gotta go help him, he's out there. Whereas my other friends were saying no and debating it and laughing at him thinking he's probably just tripping out, going out in the woods to go pee. So I go running after him, nearly butt naked, as I said, in my boxers and a wife beater, calling out his name, looking for him. But all I heard was screaming. After probably about 12 or so minutes, I wasn't going to venture further out, and I could still hear him screaming. It was at this point that I was really torn between. On one hand, I thought he was either messing with us, was either half asleep himself, sleepwalking or something, or playing a prank on us. On the other hand, I knew this friend of mine very well, and he sounded like he was genuinely distressed, that something bad was happening, and that his voice kept getting further and farther away from us. Not sure exactly how to take care of the situation myself, I ran back to camp and told the guys we needed to get in contact with the law enforcement. They laughed at me, but they went along with it. So we quickly packed up our things, made our way back, which at most we were probably three or four miles from the nearest park ranger station. We contacted a ranger, told him our situation, and a search and rescue ensued within hours. Well, as it turns out, I'll give you the short condensed version, is within about seven hours they had found him and he was taken about six and a half miles away from our campsite. He seemed relatively unscathed physically. Emotionally and mentally, he was never the same person again. And in fact, he could hardly talk or even describe to the rangers what had happened. What's also more bizarre is he was completely naked. When I last left him by the campfire... He was fully clothed in his Romeos, his jeans, and his Carhartt jacket. But when they found him, he was completely stark naked. His clothes were nowhere to be found, and he was sitting near a small creek just rocking back and forth, muttering to himself. We had talked and speculated, not with him, but with ourselves, that he had some massive mental breakdown or maybe he had took some strong hallucinogenic drugs we were unaware of, but that doesn't quite explain how he had traveled six and a half miles away in the condition he was in. And here's why. To get where he was found was extremely tough. I'm talking lots of dense foliage among a whole bunch of other hazards. And to do so unscathed is something else entirely. Now, for a while, again, we just wrote it off that he had a mental breakdown and he must have just wandered off. Well, a few months later, we didn't really talk to him a whole lot, but for whatever reason, he felt very comfortable with me and would confide in me things. Well, as I said, a few months go by and we finally start talking, and he's still very emotionally and mentally messed up from this, by the way. But at least he started talking to me. Now, they were more fragmented sentences, but the only thing he really talked to me about it is that he was taken. And of course, I asked him, very confused, what took you? Why? Who? And he just kept saying, it took me. And he would just repeat those words over and over and over again. It took me. It took me. It took me. And so there really wasn't a whole lot of conversation in him. Now, it's not like he was at home just casually living his life. He spent, gosh, months in a mental hospital, trying different medications, trying to figure out what was wrong with him. And that, the conversation I'm recalling for you, is really the only conversation him and I had that was more than a couple of minutes after that event. 
And as months went on, I kind of just lost contact with him. I guess he had gotten out of the hospital and moved in with other family. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Last I heard, he had deleted his Facebook years ago. He doesn't have a Twitter, an Instagram, a TikTok. I mean, the man is completely off the grid in terms of the internet and social media, so I really haven't tried to talk to him or contact him. None of my other friends who were with us that night have heard anything from him. So that's why I said something happened to him that caused him to just go off the deep end entirely. But what? None of us really know. I myself am not really sure what else to think other than that he had some sort of psychotic breakdown. Because remember, this is the same friend that claimed he was seeing yellow eyes off in the distance, but none of us saw it. And I have no idea if the events of that evening have any part to play in his decision to wander off or what had happened to him. I'm going to restate this, that after we all went to bed, all of us except for two friends, the one that sat out there with him to talk to him by the campfire, and the friend who had disappeared. Now I guess the friend who had sat out there to sit with him by the campfire actually turned into bed probably no more than 20 or so minutes later after having a beer and passing out. And he even mentioned that the friend who disappeared was acting different, like he was more reclusive and would only speak in very short, fragmented sentences. I could go on and on, but I feel like I've told you pretty much everything I know and everything you need to know to piece together the story. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on this and what do you think happened to him. This was back in 2017. I should have mentioned that. Now, I've told this to another friend of mine, and he recommended that I read the 411 series by David Politis. And I just might, if maybe that sheds any light on it. I know nothing of the subject. So again, if you choose to read this to your audience, maybe they can help and ask questions or try and give their opinion on what they think happened. Because honestly, it's been on my mind a lot, especially since COVID and the pandemic. I miss him. We had a lot of good times together. And I hope wherever he is, whatever he's doing, that he's okay. We had rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere surrounded by desert and mountains. This was in the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona, where a group of my friends and I decided to go on a weekend getaway. This was a perfect place to escape life, to kick back and enjoy some good old-fashioned relaxation. On our first night there, we gathered around a fire pit, cracking jokes. Now as the sun dipped below, we couldn't help but notice just how clear the southwest sky was. The stars themselves were out in full force, casting a glow on our surroundings. My buddy decided it would be a great idea to tell some ghost stories. He always did have this wicked sense of humor that could make even the bravest person shiver. But as he started to tell the story... Something strange caught our attention, because off in the distance, we saw what looked like three glowing orbs hovering just above the ground. They seemed to be pulsating. Now, I don't know about you, but that ain't no natural phenomenon I've ever heard of. We stared at these mysterious lights for what felt like hours, when suddenly, they just vanished at a lightning speed. You best believe we were freaking out. But being curious and slightly reckless, we wanted to know more. The next day, with whatever courage we had, we ventured out toward where we had saw those strange lights. As we approached, my friend Keisha stopped dead in her tracks. You guys hear that? She had whispered urgently. We had strained our ears and sure enough, there was a faint humming sound coming from somewhere nearby. As if there was some large metal object buried in the sand. Now let me tell you something. This scenario was straight out of one of those sci-fi movies. Underneath us was this rumbling vibration. We could feel it. I swear, if Will Smith had shown up right then and there, I wouldn't have been surprised. Things were already beyond belief. As we circled around, the hum seemed to die down after a while. 
and a sudden gust of wind just kicked up out of nowhere, like it was orchestrated. The humming sound then grew louder and more intense, until it was almost unbearable to stand on. But we're out here in the middle of the desert. There shouldn't be anything underneath the ground that would cause this sort of humming. We would clap our hands over our ears and drop to the ground. It got so bad. And just as quickly as it had all started, everything fell silent. We slowly got back on our feet, and when we looked around, everything felt and seemed normal. Now, I don't know what you guys believe about aliens or otherworldly beings, but after that experience, there's something going on under the ground. Now, to this day, when we get together and reminisce about that crazy weekend outside of Phoenix, ain't nobody's laughing at stories like that anymore. I grew up around the Apache Reservation in Arizona, and let me tell you, there's a whole lot of nothing out there, but there is a lot of weird stuff that happens, and that's what my story is centered around. Nothing scary like monsters in the woods or aliens coming down to abduct you, but something out of place. Sometimes, you'll find something that makes you stop and wonder, what the heck is going on? Now, my family owned a small ranch just outside the reservation, and I spent a lot of my childhood years exploring those wide open spaces. Now, as an adult, with a penchant for whiskey and storytelling, I find myself reminiscing about one particular incident that still bothers me to this day. It was on one of those hot afternoons where the air felt like it was trying to smother you with its embrace. My buddy Travis and I were out riding our horses near an old abandoned mine, and we came across something peculiar. There, right in the middle of nowhere, stood a perfectly intact phone booth. Now keep in mind, this was long before cell phones became everyone's lifeline. So finding a phone booth way out here was like stumbling upon an oasis in the desert. And it was in immaculate condition. It looked like it was brand new and had just been stuck here. Travis, of course, looked at me with raised eyebrows and said, Well, ain't that something? His voice dripping with sarcasm. We both laughed but decided to check it out anyway, because why not? As we got closer, though, things started to get weird. First off, there wasn't any road or path leading up to this phone booth, just desert as far as the eye could see. And secondly, probably the weirdest thing, there was no telephone lines connected to it. The thing seemed to be just standing there all by itself, like some sort of mirage. I dismounted my horse and cautiously approached the booth while Travis hung back with his usual devil-may-care attitude. I opened the door and noticed a faint, burnt smell. I found that not only was there an actual working phone inside, but also a thick phone book filled with names and numbers I didn't recognize, addresses that didn't make sense. Feeling equal parts still curious and unnerved, I picked up the receiver, expecting to hear nothing but silence on the other end. Instead, I was greeted with a dial tone. I looked back at Travis, who just shrugged and said, Go on then, give it a call. I decided to humor him and dial my own home phone number. To my astonishment, the call went through and my mother answered on the other end. We exchanged a few confused words before I hung up, not wanting to waste any more time or money on this bizarre event. As we rode away from that phone booth, I couldn't help but feel like we had stumbled upon something that wasn't meant for us to find. It felt as if we had trespassed into some hidden corner of reality where logic and reason held no sway. The entire time, I felt like I shouldn't have been there, that there was something wrong about it. Travis and I couldn't stop talking about this mysterious phone booth as we continued to ride through the desert. 
We even joked about calling long-lost relatives or maybe even the president himself from that lonely outpost. As the sun began to dip, painting the sky with hues of orange and red, we decided to make camp for the night near an old, dried-up riverbed. The air had cooled down just enough for us to build a small fire, without the fear of burning down half of Arizona. As we sat there under the stars, sipping whiskey from a shared flask and swapping old stories, we still couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The night seemed darker than usual, as if all light was being swallowed up by some unseen force. And there was this strange sense of being watched, like there were eyes out here in the darkness studying our every move. Neither Travis nor I were easily spooked. After all, we'd grown up in these parts and knew every nook and cranny like the back of our hands. But that night felt different somehow. We eventually drifted off to sleep despite our unease, only to be awoken sometime around midnight by a sound that scared us. It was faint at first, almost indifferent against the backdrop of howling wind and rustling brush. But it soon grew louder until it became impossible to ignore. It sounded like ringing. A telephone ringing out there in the dark desert night. Travis and I exchanged nervous glances before grabbing our lights and heading in the direction where we had found the phone booth earlier that day. We were pretty unnerved, and we moved cautiously through the moonlit landscape, guided only by memory and intuition. We finally reached the spot where the phone booth had stood. Our flashlights revealed that it was gone, vanished without a trace. All that remained was a small patch of flattened sand and an eerie silence that almost seemed to mock our disbelief. We searched the area for any sign of what might have happened to this inexplicable structure. Perhaps a truck came by and picked it up, but there was no tire tracks, no foot tracks. But there was nothing, no debris, no indication whatsoever that it had even been there in the first place. Defeated and a little more than scared, we made our way back to camp and tried to get some sleep by downing more whiskey. And every time I closed my eyes, I couldn't shake the image of that darn phone booth standing alone in the desert like some sort of twisted monument. The next morning, we packed up our gear and rode back home. We didn't talk much on the journey. I think both Travis and I were trying to make sense of what we'd experienced out there in the desert. Neither of us have been able to come up with any sort of satisfactory explanation for what happened. That phone booth remains a great mystery to me, and sometimes, when I'm sitting around a fire with friends or nursing a glass of whiskey, I can't help but wonder if maybe, just maybe, someone else is out there in those wilds, stumbling upon the same damn phone booth. Growing up in this little town in Massachusetts... And me and my buddy Mikey would always go out venturing in the woods behind our houses. We were just a couple of knuckleheads, maybe 13 or 14 years old at the time. I mean, what else are you going to do when you're stuck in a small town with nothing but trees for miles and miles? Anyway, one day in August, we decided to venture deeper than we ever had before. It was like an adventure straight out of Stand By Me or something, except without the dead body, thank God. So we packed our backpacks with some sandwiches and sodas and set off on our grand expedition. We must have been walking for hours, going further and further into the unknown, until we stumbled upon an old, creepy, abandoned homestead just sitting there in the middle of nowhere to rot. Now look, I know what you're thinking. This is how every horror movie starts, and believe me, I thought the same thing too. But being young and dumb, we couldn't resist taking a peek inside. The front door creaked like a stereotypical old abandoned house. 
something straight out of a haunted house flick. There was dusty old dilapidated furniture, things covered in cobwebs, and mainly just shattered glass. We looked around, but we didn't really know what we'd find. There really wasn't much left. It looked like there was fresh cigarette butts and spray paint. We decided to explore more, and Mikey suddenly froze in his tracks near an old fireplace that looked like it hadn't seen flames in years. He pointed towards an ancient-looking painting hanging above it. It was this creepy portrait of some old dude with antlers growing out of his head. I'll never forget that one. Now let me tell you, I'm not one to spook easily, but the paintings gave me some serious heebie-jeebies, like nobody's business. But Mikey, gosh, the kid had other ideas. He wanted to take it home as some sort of twisted souvenir. I tried to talk him out of it, but he insisted, saying that we'd come all this way and might as well have something to show for it. So, against my better judgment, we took the painting down and headed back home. As we made our way through the woods, we started hearing these weird noises, like branches snapping, heavy footfalls, and leaves rustling behind us. We were convinced that the squatter who was living there was following us. I kept telling Mikey that we should ditch the painting and get out of here, but he stubbornly refused. And the further we went, the more paranoid I became. I swear, I could feel eyes on me from every direction. And after what felt like forever, we had made it back to our neighborhood, and just in time too. Because this was the day and age where, if the streetlights came on and you weren't home, you'd get a whooping. That night, as I lay in bed trying to shake off the creepiness of the day's events, I got a call from Mikey. He sounded terrified out of his mind. Apparently, ever since he brought the darn painting home with him, strange things were happening. His door was slamming shut by itself, and a few things had thrown off his desk by themselves. That's when we agreed to meet up. The plan was to take the painting back to the old house, because apparently it was cursed or something. Now, I actually didn't go with Mikey to take it back, and I don't think he took it all the way back. From what I remember him telling me is that he took the painting and walked out into the woods, I don't know how far in, and just set it there on the ground. Now, we didn't really check on it to see if someone came and got it, but, but after a few days had gone by, the painting was gone so I can only assume that whoever or whatever was living there had come and taken it back. Now, from that day forward, Mikey nor I ever ventured that deep into those woods again. We stayed right along the tree line, and so if you ever find yourself in a similar situation, be careful, because we could have gotten seriously hurt, or worse, kidnapped. This story takes place back in my early 20s. I was studying astrophysics at a prestigious university. My friends and I, being the curious minds that we are, would often venture out into the night to explore the mysteries of the cosmos through our telescopes. On one such evening, an experience occurred that defies conventional explanation and has stayed with me ever since. It was a clear, moonless night, perfect for stargazing. A group of us had gathered on a hill just outside of town, away from the light pollution that obscured our view of the heavens. We were excitedly discussing recent discoveries in astronomy as we set up our equipment, preparing for an evening of observation. As we peered through our telescopes, marveling at distant galaxies and nebulae, one of my friends suddenly exclaimed, then had pointed and spotted something unusual in the sky. Intrigued, we all turned our attention to where he was pointing. There, hovering silently above the horizon off in the distance, was an object unlike anything any of us had seen before. It appeared to be a sphere made entirely of shimmering light. Not quite solid, yet not transparent either. 
Its color shifted continuously between hues of blue, red, green, and yellow, and it casted this eerie yellow, ominous glow of the trees underneath it. My friends and I exchanged puzzled glances as we tried to rationalize what we were seeing. Could it be some sort of atmospheric phenomenon? An experimental aircraft, perhaps? Or even evidence of extraterrestrial life? As we debated amongst ourselves, this strange ball of light began to slowly move across the sky. We watched as it gracefully ascended higher until it just vanished and kind of melted into the clouds. Now that night, as we continued to observe the sky, our conversation inevitably turned back to the orb we had witnessed earlier. We then began discussing various scientific theories that could potentially explain its existence, from ball lightning to rare atmosphere conditions. However, none of these explanations seemed to fully satisfy our curiosity. Hours passed, and our eyelids grew heavy. We decided it was time to pack up our equipment and head home. And as we drove back towards town, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this mysterious phenomenon than met the eye. Over the following four weeks, I became somewhat obsessed with unraveling the mystery of this orb. I spent hours at the library, poring over scientific journals and books on unexplained phenomena, searching for any clues that might shed light on what we had seen. One evening, as I sat in my dorm room contemplating my latest findings, there was a knock. It was one of my fellow stargazers from that night. He, too, had been unable to forget about the strange object and had been conducting his own research into possible explanations. He excitedly shared with me that he had stumbled upon several other accounts of UFO sightings in the same area where we had seen this phenomenon. Now, these reports spanned decades with some dating back as far as the 1940s. What's more, many of these eyewitnesses described seeing similar glowing spheres of light, often accompanied by unexplained phenomena such as electrical disturbances and strange sounds. This new information only served to deepen our fascination. We decided to join up in our research efforts, hoping that together we might uncover the truth. Our collaboration led us down numerous paths. We interviewed local residents who claimed to have witnessed similar things to analyzing satellite images of the area in search of any unusual patterns or anomalies. We even managed to secure a meeting with a retired military officer who had been once stationed at a nearby base. He even claimed to have knowledge of classified government projects involving advanced aerial technology. But, despite our best efforts, we were no closer to finding a definitive explanation for what we had seen that night on the hill. The more we delved into the subject, the more questions seemed to arise. Were these sightings merely coincidences? Or was there truly something extraordinary taking place in this small corner of the world? Now, as time went on and our studies became increasingly demanding... My friend and I eventually had to put our investigation on hold. Yet even now, years later, I find myself occasionally gazing up at the night sky and wondering about that UFO. It might be tempting to dismiss such experiences as mere flights of fancy or products of overactive imaginations. I do believe there is value in exploring these mysteries. For it is through seeking answers to life's most perplexing questions that we continue to expand. I had spent around 10 years of my life living around eastern Texas, where my husband, our two kids, and I resided in a cozy little house surrounded and nestled in a grove of tall, ancient oak trees. They had been there long before we ever moved in. Their branches intertwined above our home, creating a canopy that shielded us from the harsh sun that cast dappled shadows across our yard. The exterior of our home was painted a warm, 
buttery yellow. It contrasted beautifully with the greenery surrounding it. A white picket fence encircled the property, giving it an almost storybook feel. Our front porch, adorned with hanging ferns and rocking chairs, was the perfect spot for lazy afternoons while my husband and I watched our kids play out in the yard. Now inside our home was a pretty typical family home, filled with lots of love and laughter, but I will spare you those mundane, unimportant details. It was during one of these afternoons when something unusual happened, something that still really, really upsets me. My husband and I were lounging on the living room couch, discussing plans for an upcoming family vacation, and suddenly we noticed flickers of an eerie orange glow reflecting off of a picture frame near the window. We both exchanged puzzled glances before we decided to investigate. Now, as I opened the front door, I saw my eight-year-old daughter standing at the edge of our fence. Her eyes were wide with terror, and she was trembling and crying, unable to tear her gaze away from something that seemed to be hovering just above the ground. I had asked her what was wrong, and at this point, I was on edge, but I tried to keep calm and my voice steady. She pointed towards the trees, her hand shaking uncontrollably. She said, Mommy, there's a... a thing. It's floating and it has huge, dark eyes. I squinted into the shadows, trying to make out what had frightened her so much. And then I saw it. There was a dark figure, about four feet tall, with the strange orange glow surrounding it. It had massive eyes that seemed to pierce right through both of us, and it floated eerily above the ground. Now, my protective instincts kicked in immediately. I didn't have time to ask questions. I felt that me and my daughter were both in danger. So I grabbed her hand, pulling her inside the house. My husband bolted the door with paddles at his heels, and he was determined to confront whatever this was. As my husband and Puddles ventured out into the yard, I held my daughter close, trying to calm her down. She clung to me tightly, sobbing into my shoulder. I could feel her heart racing against mine, and I couldn't help but worry about what was lurking outside. From our living room window, we watched as my husband cautiously approached the spot where we had seen the thing. Puddles sniffed around intently, his ears perked up, and his tail wagging nervously. My husband scanned the area. I could tell he was apprehensive, but he continued. The air inside the house was feeling very thick with tension. My daughter continued to tremble in my arms. I tried to reassure her that everything would be okay, but deep down, I wasn't so sure myself. After probably about ten minutes, my husband returned to the house, Puddles trotting by his side. He looked puzzled, but mostly unharmed. He said he couldn't find anything, but spoke it with a sigh of relief. He claimed that whatever it must have been had disappeared. We spent the rest of the evening discussing what could have caused such a strange occurrence. We considered every possibility, from an elaborate prank orchestrated by neighborhood kids to maybe some sort of optical illusion created by the shadows and light. But there was no explanation that seemed to fit. Although we tried our best to put it behind us and return to our normal lives, there was a lingering sense of dread that settled in our home like a dense fog. But, fortunately... Over time, life finds its way of resuming its familiar rhythm. School days filled with learning and laughter. Evenings spent gathered around the dinner table sharing stories from the day and weekends exploring or having picnics. Yet, despite our attempts to forget that encounter, there were moments when something would catch our eye. A flicker of movement in the corner of our vision of an unexpected flash of orange light. 
that we would be reminded of what happened that day. And my daughter gradually overcame her fear and began to venture outside again. I would sometimes catch her staring off into the woods with a look of uneasiness on her face. I couldn't help but think that perhaps, somewhere deep in the woods, something was staring back at her. Within weeks, we started to notice strange things happening around the house, mostly with my daughter. There's a couple times during the night that she would wake up screaming, crying, complaining of horrific nightmares of this, what she would call the orange man, coming in through her window and grabbing her and taking her. And every time it would pick her up, she would wake up. She would complain of this electrical jolting sensation on the backs of her hands and her back. Very strange. And then, within a couple weeks of that, she began complaining and saying that there was whispers in her room and voices. The voices she did not recognize. She began to tell us that her room was haunted. My husband and I had no idea what to do, so we called a priest to come bless the house. Now the priest got there, heard our story. We didn't tell him about what had happened with the whole levitating orange figure, but we told him about what had happened recently with our daughter. As soon as he got to her room, his entire demeanor changed. He said there was a spirit in here, and he did his blessing and his prayers and said everything should be good now. After that, activity still happened, mainly just at night, but it eventually died down to the point where it seemed to stop entirely. And so we thought things were fine for the longest time. Now let's fast forward a bit. My daughter, having graduated from high school and freshly 18, had started her first year in college. She was living the dorm life with a few of her friends. And I'll never forget that cold night in November when she gave me a call. To preface, she would call me every week, right around the same time, on Tuesday nights. That was because her schedule then wasn't bombarded with homework, classes, and friends. And that's when she dropped the news. He's back. And I told her, what do you mean he's back? And she began to explain in detail that she had been having these horrific, vivid nightmares like she used to have back when she was a little girl. This orange man would climb through her window, would try to grab her and take her. And she was having those same nightmares again. Now keep in mind, she wasn't having any other trauma or nothing else horrific had happened in her life. She was also reporting strange voices in her dorm room. Well, long story short, a few months of living in that dorm room, she decided to switch dorms and everything was okay. As far as I know, nothing like that has happened with my daughter since then, and I have no way to describe or understand what caused what and why what I just described to you had happened. But maybe by sending this to you, you can give me some answers, although I guess it doesn't really matter much now. My story isn't all that crazy, but I'll tell you anyway, because it is actually kind of funny. So, there I was in the middle of nowhere. You know, just like the time when I went to a vegan restaurant and asked for a cheeseburger. My buddy Jim, who is this obnoxiously fit hiker guy, had dragged me along on one of his insane hiking trips in the Adirondacks. I mean... What's wrong with staying at home and binge-watching TV like normal people? Anyway, we were coming down from some godforsaken mountain peak, Mount Kill Me Now or something, and we still had about six miles to go before reaching our car. Now, quick note, I have no idea how I made it this far, but it must have been the need for survival. And if there's anything worse than hiking up a mountain, it's hiking down one. Jim, being the self-righteous fitness freak he is, kept speeding ahead like some sort of marathon runner. Seriously? Just slow down and enjoy nature. So naturally, I'm left trailing behind like an asthmatic turtle with a heart condition. It wasn't exactly fun. Now I'm walking alone in the wilderness, 
and I suddenly hear these extra footsteps keeping pace with me in the woods. At first, I thought it might be another hiker who had got lost, or maybe even Jim finally realizing he should stick with his less athletic friend. But every time I turned to look, nothing, nada, zip. These phantom footsteps would stop when I stopped and start again when I moved forward. It was like having an invisible stalker with really bad timing. I couldn't shake off this eerie feeling of being watched or followed by something or someone. You know that creepy sensation you get when your mother-in-law comes over unannounced? Yeah, that kind. But instead of freaking out and getting all paranoid, which would have been totally understandable, I decided to channel my inner beatboxer and started making beats to motivate myself to keep going. Now picture this, an out-of-shape guy beatboxing his way through the woods like some sort of delusional hip-hop artist. I'm pretty sure even Bigfoot would have been too embarrassed to be seen with me. But hey, it worked. I made it back to the car without any more weird incidents. Jim was already there, of course, looking all smug and refreshed. Ugh. So, you'd think that after reaching the car, everything would have gone back to normal, right? Wrong. You see, it's almost as if the universe has a twisted sense of humor. As we're driving back home, with Jim going on and on about how amazing the hike was, I couldn't shake off the lingering feeling that something wasn't right. Like an itch you can't scratch, or when you forget your phone at home and feel naked without it. Now, a few days go by. I'm at home doing my usual routine of avoiding any form of physical activity, and I start hearing those footsteps again. Those same creepy footsteps from the woods. And now they're in my house. I thought at first that maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Kind of like when you eat too much pizza before bed and have those bizarre dreams. But these phantom footsteps were real. Every time I walked around my house, there they were. Following me. Like some sort of clean ex-girlfriend who can't take a hint. And let me tell you... Nothing makes you question your sanity more than having an invisible stalker living with you. So what do I do? Well, instead of calling a priest or ghost hunters, which might have been the logical thing to do, I decided to confront this unseen presence head on. I stood in the middle of my living room and said, in my most assertive voice, All right, buddy, enough is enough. Either show yourself or get out of here. And guess what happened? Nothing. And then the footsteps stopped. Just like that. Poof. Now either my brave confrontation scared off whatever entity had taken an interest in me, or it realized that following a guy with a penchant for beatboxing and binge-watching TV was more boring than ever. Either way, I haven't heard those footsteps since. So that's my story. I'm sorry if it isn't all that exciting. I got a story to share that will really stick with you. In the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, there was this old abandoned church that had been essentially swallowed by the forest. The place was known to be haunted by some, and there were a lot of people that avoided it like the plague. But... My buddies and I, being adventurous and sometimes reckless, decided to go and explore this creepy location one day in the fall. We would made our way up the woods, stepping over fallen branches and crunching on dead leaves. I couldn't help but think how ridiculous we must have looked. A group of grown adults seeking out some cheap thrills in an old, haunted church. But hey... What else are you going to do on a Saturday night in rural Georgia? We finally reached the church after about 45 minutes. It was hard to find, but we finally found it, and it was in a much worse condition than I remember. The moonlight cast the perfect amount of light to make it look like it was out of a horror movie, 
hesitating for just a moment before pushing open the creaky doors. Inside, it was dark and damp, and there was only a few slivers of moonlight piercing through the cracks in the walls. We wandered around for a while, taking in all the details. Dusty pews covered in cobwebs, broken stained glass windows, letting in cold drafts of air, and even an old, rusty, dirty organ. Feeling brave, or perhaps just foolish, we decided to split up into pairs to cover more ground. Of course, there was also a lot of trash. My friend Tom and I ventured down into the basement. We found a bunch of old chairs and some other storage equipment, and an ancient baptismal font filled with stagnant water. Suddenly, from somewhere above us, we heard strange noises echoing throughout the church. What sounded to me like guttural screams mixed with something that sounded similar to laughter. Tom immediately jumped to his feet with wide eyes, so I knew he was hearing it too. He shouted up at our friends who were undoubtedly playing some kind of prank on us, saying, you guys can cut it out now. But then the chanting started. It was low at first, but gradually grew more and more intense. We couldn't make out any words, but the rhythm of it was creepy. Seriously, guys, this isn't funny anymore, he yelled out again at them. And just as suddenly as it had started, the chanting stopped altogether. Tom and I exchanged a glance before bolting back up the stairs to find our friends huddled together in the main hall, pale-faced and trembling. They heard it too, and we all nodded silently in agreement that we should probably leave, but for whatever reason, we weren't done here yet. As we continued to explore, our curiosity led us to one of these smaller chapels hidden in a dark corner. The air felt colder here, like evil had recited here. It was as if something sinister had taken up residence in this long-forgotten place. And the first thing we noticed upon entering the smaller chapel was the pentagrams crudely painted on the floor. They were large and looked as though they'd been there for years. But what truly made our blood run cold was the dark stain in the center of each symbol. It looked eerily like dried blood. We exchanged nervous glances, suddenly aware that maybe this wasn't just an innocent exploration anymore. This could have been a place where dark rituals or, God forbid, other unspeakable acts had taken place, and we might have unknowingly stumbled upon something far more dangerous than any typical ghost story. The atmosphere in that moment grew so heavy with dread, you could cut it with a knife. It felt like eyes were on us everywhere. None of us dared to speak, but we all knew what each other was thinking. It was time to get out of there, and fast. We quickly retraced our steps, trying to shake off the feeling that we were being followed or unwanted by something malevolent. We hurried through the dark halls, and the once creepy details of the church now seemed downright terrifying. When we finally made it outside, it was like the air that had been oppressive was now lifted. We didn't stop running to look back. We ran the entire way back, turning 45 minutes into 20 minutes, back to our car where we finally caught our breath. Listen, I'm going to make this simple. I don't know what was there. I don't know what was going on. I don't know if people were currently living there or what. But there was some serious dark energy in that old church. I didn't like it. 